Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Live Ultralight podcast. Today, we have a very special episode and a guest on. Tracy, or also known as the Reluctant Hiker on YouTube, um, is here because she has won the Shadowlight through hiking competition. So congratulations, Tracy. We're excited to have you on and hear about how that through hiking experience went. So thank you uh, so much. <laughs> for those of you that didn't know um, that competition, there are some runners up that, that are still, I think, in the in the running. But um, essentially, I was just looking it up, actually, because I didn't head this whole project up. But thousand um, dollars in store credit plus a new shadow light, right, is what. Yes, that's correct. Was. So hopefully that that helps you replace any gear you might have worn out on the trail. <laughs> <laughs> But um, cool. let's start. Let's start clear back at the beginning, um, Tracy, and tell us just a little bit about you and what made you want to go and do a through hike. So um, my name is Tracy. I'm, I'm also known as Reroute on the trail. Um, I actually got into backpacking, camping, all of this because my husband was actually researching hiking the PCT. And he wasn't going to do it until next year. And he just kept researching, watching videos on YouTube and all this. And he started buying some gear. And he said, you know, I think you should go with me. And I kept going, I'm never going to do anything like this. <laughs> and <laughs> as he's researching and, you know, the guys, you guys usually hold on to the remotes. So at <laughs> night, if we'd sit there and watch something, it would usually be a YouTube video. And uh, so eventually I just started watching with him. I gave in. And then at Christmas time, I said to him, all right, I'll go with you. And he said, well, you know, if you're going to go with me, I think we need to ditch the PCT idea and we need to go with the AT idea because you've never done any hiking. You've never done any camping. And the AT is you've, set up better for this. You've not done any I had really not. I mean, we live in Oregon, so we okay. do hike around town and things like this. And there are some hills for us to hike, uh, but we've never done any camping or backpacking. Nothing like this. Neither of you had. Um, no, he okay. he's done a little bit. I would say he's he's probably done a little bit more than I had at this point. But yeah, really not to the extent that you need to <laughs> to go on this. Okay. okay. So as we're you know, researching everything. Um, I actually was trained to be a teacher. And um, when we moved to Oregon after my husband retired from the military, um, I found out that I couldn't teach here because I didn't have a master's degree. And so um, I started, once my youngest got into high school, I started working a retail job and um, I enjoyed it. But when COVID hit, uh, everybody started getting really, really angry. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it was difficult to um, go to work every day and get cussed at, like on a continual basis. <laughs> and yeah. I just, I came home from work one day and this was probably um, in March. So it was right around my birthday time. And I said, you know what? Could I hike this year? And he goes, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I thought we were going to hike next year together. I can't hike this year. And I said, yeah, you know, I was thinking I've never, ever in my life done anything without you. So I was thinking maybe I should just do this on my own. And he's like, <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> and in the meantime, I had been researching gear, like I said, I research things very different from my husband and uh, he goes and he gets all the best reviews and all this stuff. And um, yeah, I, I kind of, I go and look on YouTube and I go and try a bunch of things. I have to have something in my hand to know what it's like, you know? And yeah. so I started, um, I actually saw you on a video and uh, <sighs> talking about the shadow light, which was coming out. And um, as somebody who had never been on a hike before, a backpacking trip, I was concerned about spending, you know, $500 on a backpack that yeah. I didn't know if I was ever going to use again. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't even know if I was going to be able to complete this hike, you know. So um, when I saw the price of the shadow light, I, I thought, you know, this is amazing. Um, it's the same weight. Uh, it, it has lots of pockets, which I like. It has all this stuff that is just fantastic. 
this is the back, this is the backpack I'm going to use, you know? And, um, so that's when I found your pack and everything. And yeah. And then, um, well, I mean, I'm going to slow you down for just one second. Okay. Um, I'm sorry you had to see me on video. That's always not fun. But um, <laughs> no, I'm I'm just curious what changed between you going with your husband and him kind of being the dri- the primary driver of why you're doing it to you being like you like what was your why? Because I mean, I get like maybe you didn't want to like like your work situation. It's like ah, I don't want to keep working at this job right now but that's not enough motivation to go and hike hundreds and thousands of miles. Right. So, so, um, what, what, what started clicking for you to be like, man, what was your, why, you know, where, where did did that drive come from? So I've always been the kind of person that once I decide something, you're not going to deter me at all. Like my focus is completely 100% in. So actually when my husband said, are you, you know, are you going to do this? I said, uh, give me a few days because I really need to make sure that I can commit to this. Um, but what I, I honestly thought about was my entire life, I lived under my parents' roof and then I went into the Navy and I was, you know, basically under somebody else's guard. And then I got married and, you know, you become a partner and then mm-hmm. I became a mom. And um, it was all very fast and I never in my life felt like I did anything that was just mine and never had anything where I knew that um, I had completed something and succeeded at something that um, was difficult. Right. And so when I, as I kept thinking about it, And like I said, you know, I've always done stuff with my husband. My husband and I have always had a partnership where, um, you know, when he's been out to sea, I've done certain things. When he comes back from sea, I do other things. You know, we've, um, you know, I've had the children and uh, we've raised them and now they were out of the house and everything. And so, uh, yeah, it, it really kind of became this thing where I thought I need to see if I can do something on my, my own. I, I need to know that I can do hard things. Right. And, right. And so it really kind of became a hard. journey for you. And, and no, that sounds really, really interesting. Um, yeah. But to be fair, just to be completely 100% honest, there were times on this trail that I would not have made it through without my husband, <laughs> because I, you know, I did, I did need to talk to him. I did need to, you know, rely on him in that way. And so he still was there for me, <laughs> but just yeah. not on a daily basis. Got it. Got it. Um, man, that that's really interesting. And I feel like I could probably relate to your, um, like once you decide something, you're going to do it type of mentality. And I could totally see myself being like, once I've committed to do this trail or whatever it is, it's like, I don't want to wait a year. Like I'm committed now. Right. Yeah. Like you get, you get in that yeah. mode too, but, um, <clears throat> well, let's keep going along kind of the, the, the order chronologically, I guess, but I'd really like to circle back to see how, you know, if, if you're, if it turned into the type of hike that you thought it might be in, in that journey for you. But so yeah. you, you kind of get committed here, you start, piecing together a few gear pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, did you do any kind of like shake out, uh, trips or anything like that where you're getting to know your gear or, I mean, what happened next? So, um, my husband has a tent, um, and he wanted to have me see what it was like to, you know, tent in the cold. And, um, so we took his tent to Beverly beach, which is, it was in, March, I guess it was. So it's really cold, but um, it wasn't my tent. It wasn't, you know. So um, once I did decide on my tent, um, we just camped in the backyard. <laughs> and that was the only thing we did. We did that one time. It was mostly a, tra- a chance for me to see how quickly I could put my tent up and, um, you know, what I could do with it, you know, see if he wanted to see if I could do it in the rain, but I refused to do it in the rain. (laughs) uh, It does rain a lot here, but um, you know, I just didn't somehow I, I made it through without trying that in practice. (laughs) We did have to do that on the trail. Yeah. You probably never had to do that on the trail, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then we did do uh, trips where we just hike. I did a trip with my husband to Bend, Oregon, which is where my son was living at the time. And um, we hiked 
I don't know, maybe like a 16 mile trip with our backpacks. They weren't full up, they weren't full weights or whatever, but maybe 16 pounds on our back and just to try it out and see how we were doing. Um, but other than that, mostly it was just hiking around town. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Like <laughs> <clears throat> that would be to me, at least that would feel like you're going in pretty unprepared, like pretty unprepared. And and, you know, the, I don't know, I, I wish I knew these percentages off the top of my head, but a lot of people start that trail and don't finish it, right? Any of the yes. hikes, um, vast majority start up, don't finish them. And I would, I mean, if I was like a betting man, I would kind of be like, it's probably people like you, Tracy. No, that's, <laughs> right? right? So, so something magic, I mean, something happened here that, that was just different, right? So um, that made you the exception, you know, because a lot of people that like, go into them and follow other through hikers per se, like they're doing trainings and obviously they've, they've been backpacking for years and they've, they've got a lot of experience. And, and, yeah. um, to me, a lot of it is just time on your feet, you know, and being able to log 10, 12 hours a day on your feet and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I'm very interested to hear how the first couple of days go. So, well, um, I will tell you, and please don't ever tell my husband because I will deny this, but <laughs> I happen to be a very stubborn person. And I think that's important. I think it, it is. is important. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good quality to have when you decide to do something like this. <laughs> right. Right. It helps <laughs> achieve. That's for dang sure. So, okay. So you've got, so you've done some very minor hikes, very mm -hmm. minor, you know, getting to know your gear. Mm -hmm. Um, so you figure out the resupply. I don't know how much we want to go into all of that. I mean, is that, was that like really daunting or did you, was it not too bad with information? Out um, there? with that, I will tell you that, um, the only rule that I had when I went out was that I was not going to come off trail, um, before seven days or 100 miles. Uh, I just made that rule for myself so that I didn't, um, give myself an excuse to uh, get out of there. You know, I, I yeah. really had to force myself to learn what was hurting, learn what was, um, you know, just what I needed to do. And that was the only way I could see myself learning that. I kind of pushed myself to, um, you know, like food. I carried eight days of food when I first started and I pretty much didn't stop that. I like to carry the food because I like to eat. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of important. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but you know, even like with my boots, my boots, I found that they just weren't working for me. Um, and I, I found that out almost immediately. Um, but I refused to come in. Um, mm -hmm. I, I set front Royal as my first stopping point. So I, I did a flip flop. I should probably clarify that. Um, I did a flip flop. I started at um, Rockfish Gap in the Shenandoahs, like the south side of the Shenandoahs. And I started there. I went up to Katahdin and then I came back to Rockfish Gap and went south from there once I um, once I was doing the flop part. Um, sure. So when I started in the Shenandoahs, it was 107 miles to uh, Front Royal. And that's where I was. I was not getting off trail until I got to that point. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. That, yeah. That's, I think that's huge. I think, honestly, um, every, I guess I shouldn't make big, bold statements like this, but I, I sometimes do that. I think the mental aspect is huge. Um, mm -hmm. I've experienced it at times in my life. And typically what I find is that once the physical side gets hurting or in pain or whatever it is, you just start working on it mentally. There's been times uh -huh. I've been planning on a four day trip. Um, and this is mainly years ago when I was, had let myself kind of get out of shape and, and whatnot. And, you know, I'd get two days into it and the person I was hiking with was getting off trail because that's what they planned to do. But I had two more days and I'm like, by the end of the day, I'm like, yeah, I'm getting off trail with you. You know, I'm just <laughs> done, you know, and, and stuff like that. Right. So, yeah. but I think it really comes, um, like that mental side is just really tough. It's, it's, and yeah. that builds upon any physical issues that may develop such as shoes or feet problems, knee problems and, and stuff. Yeah. So, um, so you could take off on this 107 mile guaranteed going to finish this aspect of it. And, and how does it go? How does like take me through like day one, day two. Okay. So I will tell you that, um, I got dropped off at Rockfish Gap at sort of like 
two in the afternoon on a day that was 86 degrees. Uh, that was the earliest I could get dropped off based on all the routes that the, the um, hostel that I was staying at. Uh, you know, they just had other things that they were doing. And so it was two, I think, in the afternoon when I got dropped off and my first day and I had planned to do 11 miles. Well, <laughs> this was the first day with my pack. It's heavy. You got eight days of heavy. Food in it. And Do you know what you, the starting weight was like? Did you weigh your pack? Uh, yes. Yeah. So my starting weight was 34 pounds um, okay. before my water. So oh, I would okay. say that that was probably I, I always carried two liters of water. So that's another four pounds, I would say. Yeah. OK. And yeah. And you feel uh, it. that's 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 <laughs> substantial. Yeah. And, uh, you know, everybody talks about the Shenandoahs. Oh, this is so easy. Oh, it's going to be so easy because they've started in Georgia. And by the time they get to, to Virginia, Virginia is easy for them. But for me, <laughs> it was not easy. So I will say that you don't want to listen to everybody else because this was not easy for me. But um, but it was fine. It, there was, it was fine. Um, what happened, though, was because it was the end of April, none of the waysides, uh, the camp areas, I should say, were open yet. And so um, where I planned to camp that first night was at a campground. But when I got there, um, actually, I sorry, that's a lie. When I planned to go to the shelter there, but um, I knew at that point um, where I was hiking, I wasn't going to make it to the shelter. So I planned from there. OK, I can go to the, this next campground that's coming up. I'll make it there. Well, I got there and it was all closed up. So. I realized that I was going to have to stealth camp. And if you see my video of me stealth camping my first night, my face is just white. It is pure white. I am in my tent just freaking out. I had a problem with my bear bag the first night. You know, like I, I caught it on a tree and I got it stuck and I, I couldn't do anything. It's dusk. And yeah. uh, I was in a panic like. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm just praying. I get this, you know, stick that's just long enough for me to, you know, sort of shimmy this bag a little bit more. And I finally got the bear bag hung semi okay. And I got in my tent and I don't think I slept a wink. I just, oh, every no. noise was like, <gasps> what is that? <laughs> uh. Go away, bear. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so this I is your, this is like, is this your first camping trip? Like, like, uh, like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Cause I know a lot of my own friends, right. That like are like nervous about solo camping and they've camped a lot. You know what I mean? And, and I always joke to people like, my, my wife will always be like, Hey, let's watch like a, like a horror or a scary movie. And I'm like, I don't do that because I solo backpack. You know what I mean? Like I don't, there's that anyway. Anyway, so that I can see that. And I know a lot of people that will highly relate to what you just said. Um, I don't know what the answer is. Maybe Tylenol PM, but uh, <laughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, also, you know, the one thing that people say about the Shenandoah is if you want to see a bear, you're going to see him in the Shenandoahs. You'll see him everywhere. So right. that is exactly I mean, I seriously sat there thinking, should I make a video for my children just in case I'm eaten tonight? <laughs> I mean, like <laughs> my mind was all over the place. Shoot. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's, that's ultimately. Tough. Like as soon as first light hit, I was out of my tent. I packed everything up and I somehow got that bear back down <laughs> and I was on my on my way. And there was no way I was not making it to the shelter that I now. So this is another three miles that I had to add on from the day before. And then I, of course, was going to that shelter that I had planned originally to go to that second night. So, so now I've got 14 miles, which was a little excessive, I think, for the second day. But um, ultimately, you know, like I said, I just I knew what I had to do to get to the shelter. And I knew that if I was 
at a shelter, I would probably be around people. And that made me feel a little bit more comfortable. And uh, so then I got to the shelter. The shelter was full. It, there were tons of young kids that were just, you know, basically got to get there, eat their dinner, uh, sleep for a few hours and then fly out the door the next morning. So I didn't sleep in the shelter. I slept in my tent, but it was right by the shelter. And again, that night, um, there was another couple there. Uh, they were called Slow Jam and Crawl. And it was their second night on trail as well. Mm. And they set up their tent right sort of by me. And that night, something came in between our tents. Now, I do not know what it was. It probably was a deer. I, I mean, I would yeah. say it probably was a deer. But to both of you know the three of us, we were sure it was a bear. And I was <laughs> in there going, <clears throat> and then Slow Jam is like, <clears throat> You know, <laughs> we're just making any kind of noise that we could. And eventually it went away and we all slept and it was fine. But <laughs> the yeah. next morning we're like, do you think that was a bear? I don't know. It might have been a deer. Yeah, it was probably a deer. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I don't want to get too off topic here, but I, I would actually be more nervous about sleeping near those shelters because that's where the bears are trained to come and look for scraps and, and things, right? So I'm like, I'm more at peace when I'm out in the woods. And I'm like, yeah, hopefully there's not a trained, a trained bear around right. here, you know, and whatnot. But yeah, that's, I'm sure you've never had another animal walk past your tent <laughs> during the rest of the Drew hike. Oh, right? never, I, never. You, you get a little more used to it. Right. Yeah. Uh, but that, <laughs> that, that, that does make your hair stand up. I had, I had an experience just last week where like something woke me up and then you hear, you know, stick break and you're kind of like, it was, you're up about a half an hour and then you're back to bed, you know, yes. just kind of waiting and listening, but yeah, no. Okay. So now you've got two semi sleepless nights. Yeah. You start day two and like, where are you at? Like, where are you at physically, mentally? So, I mean, I'm sore. <laughs> um, it's been really hot. So, I mean, I've been exhausted, but there's been a lot of water sources. I mean, it's the end of April, so there's still water everywhere. Um, I, I've had no problem finding water. Mentally, I'm just, I'm really excited to be out there. And, um, okay. but I was really hoping to meet people. You know, I met Slow Jam and Crawl, but then they ended up having to get off trail on their third day. So this next day, um, they were going into whatever town was there uh, because Slow Jam's shoes were too small. And so she she just had to get off and and that was all fine. And um, But these people that I, in fact, I stay in touch with them still, but I say my best friends from my first days on trail <laughs> that I only saw that one time. <laughs> There was a bond that was made. And yes. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I, I um, went on to the next shelter that next night and I actually met um, some people that uh, one of the girls that I met called Heater, she is going to hike the Pinhoti Trail um, coming up soon. And uh, she invited me to go with her. So that's I'm going on the trail with her. Uh, she at the time had come from Georgia. So she had trail legs, all this whole group, they all had trail legs going on. Um, but they were super kind, uh, got into the shelter, you know, way later than they all did. They had been there for hours um, and they had beer and offered me a beer. And that's really refreshing on a really hot day after hiking and um, yeah. relaxing you know, a bit. We just, yeah, we just kind of started chatting. And um, the next day, I, um, left my hiking my trekking poles at a wayside now think of this most people when you hike with trekking poles that's like an extension of your arm so yeah. it's really difficult to think that you would actually be able to leave them somewhere and not realize it right. but i guess i hadn't been hiking long enough that um it really didn't occur to me i went over to one of the the rubbish bins and you know they're difficult in there in the Shenandoahs because you've got to use both hands to get in there and open everything up and so I must have set the poles down and you know never thought about them again 
until Must I was have, about, meaning you never found these things. <laughs> yeah. So I got about a mile down the trail and I realized, oh, no, this is really bad because uh, I don't know how I'm going to get over all these rocks today <laughs> without a little bit of extra steadying power. Yeah. And I happened to find a stick, which um, this kind of became a joke, but I found this stick which had the head of an eagle, I swear to you. And I called this thing spirit because spirits was going to get me through this day. <laughs> and, and he did. I got all the way to the next shelter and this whole group of, of young people were there. And I told them what happened. I said, you guys meet spirit. <laughs> and the next morning, um, one of the, the gentlemen that was there, he was called teacher. And he said to me, I, I want you to have my trekking poles. And I was like, no, 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 that you can't do that. I've got spirit, you know, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, you know, I've walked almost 900 miles without these trekking poles. They've just been attached to my pack. So go ahead. They're yours. Gave me these trekking poles. It was amazing. <laughs> well, so, trail magic. Um, yeah, <laughs> definitely trail magic. And that, there's more to that story because I had three sets of trekking poles on that trip, <laughs> but I'll get into that later. If you <laughs> Got it. So, yeah. so let's, let's kind of finish out this first, this first 107 miles. I just kind of yeah. want to hear like, so you're, you're, you're making it challenges every single day. Um, mm. What was in your mind, just the hardest part of that first week and not getting off trail? I think, um, honestly, it was just getting my body used to um, hiking every day. You know, that's a, a really different change for your body. You don't realize it before you get on trail, but, you know, hiking every day, getting up and that is your job, essentially, you know, mm -hmm. um, but you have to hike to get to your next destination. And, um, you know, you can't, I mean, you could sleep in if you <laughs> if you want, but then you're going to be hiking in the dark, which I'm not that great at, um, you know, so I think it was just mentally and physically adjusting to that change of this is now what you're doing every single day. Was it a lot of soreness or did you have like pinpointed pain going on? Um, I think it was just rent, you know relative soreness but i did have some pain in my toes because my uh, my boots though they were large enough for me for normal hiking they weren't appropriate for going up and down so steeply mm -hmm. and so uh, i had pain in my toes <laughs> did you stick with the boots the whole hike or did you no, go I, to a trail I, runner Oh, I did stick with boots, but I ended up going uh, to a different type of boot. Um, I, st I, I had Solomon's. Um, I swear by Solomon's, uh, but these boots, the first boots, um, also they weren't, ended up not being waterproof, but I went to another pair of Solomon's and they had torn through almost after a hundred miles, they had just torn through. Um, I ended up going to a uh, I think they were called the um, Quest. They're mm -hmm. like a, a little sturdier boot. And those ended up being what I wore the entire rest of the trail. And uh, awesome. they're a good sturdy boot for me. Yeah, I've my feet love Solomon's. I kind of look at Solomon's as like, there's nothing that flashy about them, but my feet just like them. I can pick up a yeah. brand new pair of Solomon's, take them on a trail, and my feet just yes. feel at home in them. So yeah, that doesn't surprise really me too much. To yeah. Yeah. You don't even really need to break them in. I mean, it's like somebody's already broken them in for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, I've had a lot of good luck. I know there's a massive following for ultras and different things, but, um, my feet have never loved ultras, but they just always feel at home in the, in the Solomon. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, okay. So it, it seems like I, I so I, I would say, so this summer, like I started running and I haven't been running for a long, long time. And it, and it developed, it showed my body real quick where I had a lot of weaknesses, um, mm -hmm. particularly like my psoas muscle and different things that was causing additional back pain as it was strengthening up and my hamstrings and stuff are just 
way too much sitting, right. And not mm. nearly as much time on the trail, but it sounds like you kind of were able to avoid a lot of like the, like this one particular, like I'm getting back pain or I'm getting like my right knee is on fire or something like that. Just, just soreness and you're cranking through your feet are hurting, yeah. but, and, and so did you take care of that right as you got into your first checkpoint or did you stick with those boots longer? You no, know, I changed them out right away at right away. front royal. Yep. Awesome. What did it feel yeah. like coming in, you know, that to that first checkpoint? You know, I was, I mean, almost in tears. It was amazing. It was this beautiful day. I come in and I call. Um, so I stayed at um, Stumble Inn. And uh, so I called Tex and I just said, hey, I'm here. And uh, they were coming to get me. And right as they pulled up in the Jeep, literally the skies open up and <laughs> just it started pouring. So it was perfect timing. So I had this beautiful first week out on trail and everything and uh, sunny, great weather. And then I was coming into this beautiful hostel. It, it was amazing. I can't even explain it. <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. like, hey, this is the finish line. I'm not, or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you're well, like, all right, turn around think, and go back out. Did you spend time there that first day? Or I did. I yeah. did. And that's actually, I ran back into the group of young people that I had um, had been kind of um, going around at, at the shelters uh, in the Shenandoahs. So heater and day hiker and pizza cutter, all these these people they were in town and they had taken a zero so um yeah. i got to meet up with them and, and hang out with them a little bit and yeah so that was fun as well that's awesome so by this point did you already have your name reroute i well it was in the works so um my very first day i got lost like you wouldn't believe and i did not have Didn't help that you started late got lost yeah. <laughs> well and the thing was that um you know i didn't realize that you had to put your phone in uh, airplane mode and so you know people were texting me all day long and i'm like oh my gosh people are texting me but you have service because you know you're so close to the road and yeah yeah i i learned very quickly that my battery pack wasn't gonna last if i kept my phone on <laughs> um you know uh, kept it in service all day long and but yeah by the end of the day you know i my phone had died and it was a mess. So uh, mm. I was glad actually to be in the tent to charge my phone. Um, but it was, it was a quick learning curve. I, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so did you get your name reroute from that first day then, or, or when did that come pretty in? much from the very first from day? That's, um, that's when people started kind of noticing that, um, <laughs> but I didn't get my name until that day that I was leaving on um, I was leaving Front Royal. That's when everybody kind of said, yeah, it should be reroute. It should be reroute because I kept saying, they'd say to me when I get into the shelter, like, well, what took you so long? And I said, well, I mean, first of all, I'm just slow, you know, but also I thought there was this really nice trail and I started walking on it. And then I realized it wasn't the trail. So I had to reroute and find my way back to the trail. And uh, yeah, I mean, it happens multiple times every day. Um, so yeah, by the time I left Front Royal, I had my name. <laughs> and does it still apply today? Did you figure it out by the end? Or, or yeah, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I I'm not going to lie to you. I still get lost in my life. My family, when I told them what my name was on trail, they all thought that they just laughed really hard they're like this is perfect for you that is that is your name <laughs> that's good <laughs> because uh when we lived in virginia this was several years ago but we lived in virginia we moved away for a little bit and then we moved back to virginia and i went to my best friend's house probably every day after work and um one day my husband asked me to go to the mall first and then um and then I had to go to her house and <laughs> I got lost and called him at midnight saying, I don't know where I am. I had to call at this time. We didn't even have mobile phones. So I had to go into a barred up Burger King. <laughs> to call and collect. huh? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so reroute, it's perfect for me, actually, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like it. I like it. Thank okay. you. We we're kind of planning on on going about an hour, so okay. I'm probably, I would I would love to like go through every week of this, um, but I'm gonna have, probably have to change up the questions here because okay. I did what just want to spend time though on that first week. I just feel like there's there's so much to pull out of it for people, um, even if they're not through hikers. I think there's a lot to pull out of it because there's if they're not through hikers, they still probably want to do some bigger hikes mm-hmm. and go and see some some things. At least if they're following us, so. Um, I think it's really interesting to go into something like that. I would say, well, maybe to finish up kind of that first week, what was kind of your biggest regrets um, that maybe you hadn't done or would change from that first week? So whether that's like kind of the pre the, the preparing stuff, or maybe it's gear items or something like what was your biggest regrets from that first week or things you changed very quickly, obviously besides the boots, but. Yeah. I mean, I think the boots were really my only thing because everything else, I think everybody goes through it. You know, I wanted to bring deodorants, you know, and we all know that it's so silly to bring deodorant because it, it it's just extra weight. I mean, we're all going to smell. Uh, the only people that don't smell out there are day hikers. So we all know, right. that, um, you know, but all those things, that's just the learning curve that everyone has. I think really it was just my boots. Okay. I think I would have done it exactly the same, um, going back, you know, and doing it again. <laughs> Do you feel like your goals for hiking were too ambitious or about right for where you're coming in physically? I think they were about right. I mean, you know, I, I would get off of work and run about eight to 10 miles a day. And oh, I, uh, so you were running, you'd been running. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that clicks a lot more for me. <laughs> I I find that running and especially if you can trail running is the best way to train for hiking. It just flat out as you're getting all of that impact and movement and, and stability and, and all of that makes a massive difference. So that, that clicks, that, that connects a lot for me because I'm like, how did you, how did you just show up and, <laughs> and cover, you know, 10 to 15 miles a day and not have injury because Almost everyone I know that tries that has injuries. Yeah. So, so um, I do have problems with my ankles. Um, and so I generally in the wintertime in Oregon, it's wet and our, our pavement all around here is pretty uneven. So um, my husband could tell you, I could trip over a pine cone and break my ankle. And so <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, that's another reason for the boots. Um, but I, so I generally in the wintertime only run on the treadmill. Okay. Um, so it is a little bit different, but you can give yourself a little bit of incline and whatnot, but yeah, yeah. it still is way more helpful than, than logging zero miles a day and then going, yeah. and going something like that. So, yeah, oh, that's pretty awesome. Okay. Um, so let's kind of turn the page into you're getting into your groove. How long do you felt like it take before you had hike, hiker legs, right. Or, or trail legs, right. Or however you want to call them. Like, what did that, what did that feel like to you? Um, you know, before you felt like your, your body had made some big adaptations. I think I would say probably about three weeks. I felt like I was pretty comfortable. I was able to make, um, much better mileage. Um, but at the same time, at that point, I was starting to get into, I think I was in Pennsylvania at that point. And um, Pennsylvania is very difficult, um, in my opinion, for me, because um, the rocks really were difficult to figure out how to step over and step. I mean, there really was no stepping over, stepping around. I mean, you were always constantly on rocks. So um, that was actually difficult. I did end up breaking two toes and the top of my uh, left foot uh, whilst I was in Pennsylvania, which is why um, I took about a month off trail, actually. Um, (laughs) But it was broken up. Um, I did break some toes and the top of my foot. And we were going into Port Clinton at the time. And, um, and I just knew there was something wrong. I, I couldn't walk on my foot, on my foot normally. Um, but yeah, so, um, so these I are kind of I, like fractures. It wasn't from an incident. It was like from, okay. Yeah, they were, you weren't, uh, you weren't packing enough, uh, 
what is that like instant milk on the trail i guess i don't know <laughs> yeah exactly no, i'm just kidding <laughs> um yeah okay, no, so I that, can't those that. are always hard to diagnose though right <clears throat> because it's not like you didn't have an impact or, or a certain thing that is in your mind you're like oh that's what did it it's just like right. so much wear and tear and beating them up constantly yeah. but, okay yeah yeah i mean so i would say that my legs came about that time but then i got off trail um for about 10 days and then you know going back on trail it seems like you lose your trail legs really quickly when you've been off trail for just a little bit um so then when i came back it took me another week i would say to get uh, my trail legs back um, so explain to me maybe <clears throat> i know because like every section of the trail is different right so you can log right. different miles some people are like you know what's your biggest you know what was your hardest day hiking and, and it could be 15 miles of just pure mountains and up and down, or it could be, right. you know, where everyone expects you to say like, oh, this day I logged 30 miles or something. But so if you were to go back, you know, once you were like a month or, you know, once you felt like you had your trail legs, if you were to go back to like hike the same place where you started, mm -hmm. how much do you feel like, like for the same amount of energy exertion or mental anguish, you know, if you were logging 10 miles, then how many would you be up to 15 now? And it would just kind of feel like the same load, if that makes sense. Or is there a way to like explain to people what that would feel like, like the difference between unconditioned legs and conditioned legs? Well, I think I have a better perspective on that than somebody else, just because of the fact that I started in the Shenandoahs and I did the flip flop. So coming back, so came to, right back. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Coming back to Virginia, I mean, I started at 25 miles coming you know, wow. going south. So yeah. um, my largest mile day was 37. Um, but my hardest mile day was probably when I was in the whites. Um, and we, I think we only did eight miles that day, but it was so, so difficult. But your entire body was sore when you were done with the day. And I know there are some people, especially younger people, I mean, uh, they could do bigger miles in the whites after, you know, going through this, but for me, it, I couldn't, I mean, we were, we were exhausted every day in the whites and More that's okay. And yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty remarkable that you almost doubled your mileage by the time you yeah. flip flopped. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's really, I, I find that very interesting, I guess. <laughs> um, it's really cool just to see how much bodies adapt and, and, and just that whole concept that, um, you know, I've, I've heard this said before, I've heard it said by a lot of people, but you know, humans really are some of the best long distance animals per se that, right. that there are, right? Like there's not many animals that can do what we can do and cover the kind of mileage we can do. So it's really cool to just see that. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know. <clears throat> um, so let's, let's think of another great question. What do you feel like our, our, where, what was the biggest surprises? What did you just not expect to happen? or to experience on the trail. Okay. And, and maybe while you're thinking about this, um, I did a, like, I got a few minutes yesterday to look at your channel and stuff. For those of you that want to hear more of, I think a chronological type order or scene, um, Tracy's done a great job with her YouTube channel. Again, I think that's reluctant hiker mm -hmm. YouTube, on YouTube, um, mm -hmm. that you can go and kind of follow along more with her journey and, and see that. I think that you'll find a lot of that interesting. I'm, like I say, I would love to just like be, have the time to just go through the whole trip. Right. So I may have to go, um, experience that on your YouTube channel as well. But <laughs> anyways, go check that out again, reluctant hiker over on YouTube. But so yeah, biggest, biggest surprises are just things that you did not expect to happen. So, um, you always hear about the trail providing. So uh, when I told you about teacher and how he gave me his trekking poles, so <clears throat> this, I told you, I get back to this story. So when we were up in Katahdin, um, I had those trekking poles that entire time. And we ended up leaving the morning we were going to summit Katahdin at about 530. And it was pouring rain. And a lot of the rocks up in Maine and New Hampshire, they're very slick when they get wet. And um, so I had fallen multiple times. It's it's just a thing with me, but it's fine. And um, we were coming, we had crossed Katahdin Stream and we were getting ready to enter the Hunt Trail and, or, well, we were getting ready to enter the climbing portion of the Hunt Trail. And there are these two huge boulders. And I knew instinctively these were going to be slick. 
And so I braced my poles, my trekking poles were in my right hand and I braced on these and I put my foot down, but it's still dark. And where I put my foot, it ended up being a root and the roots are very slick as well. And my feet just went out from under me. My arm hit the boulder that I was trying to lean against because it had slammed up and immediately my trekking poles flew out. Well, uh, we had just crossed Katahdin Stream. <laughs> so um, somebody <laughs> has um, probably found these by now, but they went into the stream and one of them went immediately away. And the other one went under a, that huge boulder that I slipped um, and or hit my arm on. It went underneath there and we couldn't get it. And wow. uh, at this point, I had a new, I had a tramley and uh, they were underdog and tractor and tractor. He's like, you know what? I haven't been using my poles. Here you go. And I said, no, 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 no. You need them. And he said, no, take them. He goes, you need these. And he gifted me his poles right there, <laughs> right when I lost mine. So that was the second set of poles or the third set of poles that I had on this trip. And uh, it, I mean, it was amazing. And, and the trail did provide for me, but the trail provided also when I was in, um, when I said to you that I broke my toes <laughs> and the top of my foot, I was in Port Clinton and we had just left the Cabela's and, you know, I, I was limping around there and I knew it was my plan to actually have gone an extra 10 miles that day um, after we had gone into this uh, Cabela's. And I knew at that point I wasn't going to be able to because I could barely walk. And um, I went <laughs> to the Walmart there. I'm just finishing up some resupply. And I had been calling the whole afternoon to the, uh, there was, there were three hotels there, I believe, or two hotels. But anyway, one of them was full up. And the other one wasn't having anybody stay there because of COVID. They were doing renovations. Um, there were supposed to be two people that were doing shuttling and nobody was available. One of them was out of town and one didn't go beyond um, the border of that town. And I thought, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm in the Walmart and this lady comes up to me and I had a pack on and this lady called Dana came up to me and she said, are you hiking the trail? And I said, I am. And I said, but I'm not hiking right now. I'm trying to find a place to stay. And she invited me to stay at her house with her family. Uh, this lady who did not know me. And uh, she took me to the doctor the next day. She, um, I mean, she and her family went somewhere the next day and they left me in their house. She completely trusted me and without knowing me at all, she left me in her house to have whatever I wanted to eat and drink and whatever. And she just was absolutely lovely, her entire family, lovely. Um, and so I was really, really shocked that when people say the trail provides to actually find that the trail provides like that. Um, right. There were there was another couple up in, I did get hurt another time <laughs> up in Maine and I had to have um, a cortisone shot in my shoulder and a lovely couple called Gary and Kathy, um, they met us and they took us to the doctor. They took us all around. They treated us to food. I mean, just absolutely brilliant. Um, you, you can't even say thank you enough to these people that do this kind of thing. And you don't feel like you're even, you know, how is this happening to me? How, you know, I don't, I'm not worthy of this. I mean, this is right. just so generous, um, right. but it's, it's just amazing. And so I would say that's probably been my biggest surprise of the trail. Um, and I would say negatively, my largest surprise was that um, doing a flip-flop um, the way that I did, it was lovely in most aspects, but when I came back down South, um, having been so used to the social aspect of the trail, I went for nearly 10 days and didn't see a person basically, uh, uh, except a day hiker here and there. It was, it was really lonely. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was shocking, but I know that I was way ahead of the bubble at that point. So I think that's, you know, um, yeah. yeah. So anyway, that was shocking. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a really interesting, um, 
I think sometimes for just, there's just good people everywhere you go. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think, I think even, even what I would add to that too, is even like internationally, if you've, if you haven't, or if other people haven't traveled internationally, it just always surprises me. There's just, there just really is really good people everywhere you go. Um, so that's, that's really cool. And, um, yeah, it's magic, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so let me, let's jump into a few other things. One thing that's always mm-hmm. fascinated me about through hiking is the food aspect, because typically for me, um, through hiking, it's, it's not in the cards for me. And, and if it's going to come in the cards, it's going to be later in my life. I've just got a young family growing business, um, and just different things that just don't really enable me to do that. You know, going out for seven, 10 days, something like that. I can, I can, I can swing that. Right. But, um, but when you do that, I'm, and I'm a little bit privileged that we, we, we sell, uh, to our members, uh, on our live ultra membership, um, foods. And so I, I always have good food, you know, a company just sent us a freeze dryer. I'm going to start freeze dry. You know, I've just always had a lot of good options and good food. And it's easier for me to spend money on that food too, because it's a short duration of time. But you're going on a through hike, you have no income for three to five months. You've got, right. you know, and, and and it gets harder, but you're also exerting a lot. And so to me, it's like, man, how do you keep up on maybe quality of food? How do you find that food? How do you not spend too much on food if that's a, a, a big factor? Um, so yeah, I mean, maybe just just spend five or so minutes talking about what kind of food you are eating and and um how. I don't know if there's, if there's how you, how it changed maybe throughout the trail. So um, the food that I ate on trail is not at all reflective of what I eat in normal life. <laughs> Let's just put that out there first, but I'm um, better I, or worse. <laughs> <laughs> I was eating pop tarts, just drizzling peanut butter on them. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, you're trying to get as enough calories, um, I, I love cliff bars. I'm very unique in that. I found most people on trail after a certain number of months do not like cliff bars anymore. Yeah. I think they get tired of them, but I love them. <laughs> and mm-hmm. cliff bars with peanut butter. <laughs> it's really good. I love, um, while I was on trail, I, I really just had things that had a lot of calories. Um, I, I knew that I was exerting a lot of energy, um, and I mean, I didn't lose any weight on trail, so I, I must have done something okay. Um, yeah. I ate at night, I ate um, the mountain house meals or whatever, the freeze dried meals. Okay. Um, and sometimes ramen as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like, that's the one that gets me is I see these like through hikers maybe put out videos there and they're like eating ramen. I'm like, how are you functioning on ramen? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you can't hike. 25 miles a day on ramen. Yeah. I can't, I, I'm, I'm a bigger guy, right? I'm like six, three, but you know, so like, I just, that's not sustainable for me, but. Um, yeah. A lot of people would just do like a packet of potatoes and I couldn't do that. I did try that one time and I just felt like I was really hungry. I didn't get enough of what I needed. And yep. I Same felt here. like it was worth it to pay the money for the mountain house meals or the, you know, refuel or peak meals or whatever they are. Um, because I knew that it had everything that I needed. And um, it was a lot easier to think about. Plus, they're usually a lot lighter than some of the other yeah. stuff. Um, and then the the heaviest portion of, of what I carried for food was m- my snacks. But I also I carried in addition to the food bag, <laughs> I carried a fanny pack and that was busting at the seams with my snacks <laughs> for every day. <laughs> Uh, I probably no ate. judgment here. I those those are lifesavers. Um, yes, I love a fanny pack. <laughs> that was like one of the biggest things I feel like I changed this year in my food is I refuse to take two of anything for like one day. Like I'll eat the same mm-hmm. thing maybe the mm-hmm. next day, the next day. But like yes. I have a Cliff Bar, I have one Cliff Bar for the day, not two or three Cliff Bars in the day. Oh. And so just that variety and having a bunch of variety and then smaller portions so that you can even have more variety for some reason, my body agreed with that more. And I also just, I found myself wanting to eat, liking, and just not getting tired of my food ever, you know, and that was, I got, and I'm going to talk about this on a later podcast, but 
um, on one of the hikes, I got pretty sick this year and I just that couldn't is. eat anything. But um, one of my coworkers, one of my, my team members had um, some jerky and that was like the only thing that sounded good. And so I, after that, I came back and I'm like, okay, I've got to have way more variety so that if that ever <laughs> happened to me again, I, I could have something in my pack at least instead of just stealing his food all the time or trading food, you know? <laughs> um, anyways, but. So of a day, I would say that I had three cliff bars I had at least every a packet day. every day. So this is what I would eat. A packet You've been eating uh, military food far too long, I think. <laughs> if you can if you can eat three Cliff Bars a day for months on end, you yeah. are very unique, Tracy. <laughs> but I also had a packet of crackers, you know, cheese or peanut butter. I had two meat sticks and a thing of M&M's and a thing of either energy jellies or energy gummies. And generally that was my, I think that was about what I ate until nighttime. And then at night um, I would have the, um, the freeze dried meal and then maybe ramen. Um, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I ate a lot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's you, you did it right. You didn't lose weight. <laughs> I think that's a good thing. So, okay. Um, Let's jump to gear for a second. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just go through like what you felt like were the most critical or favorite pieces of gear that you had on the trail. Maybe list your top three or something like that. Okay. Well, I, I know I've said this before, but my ultimate top piece of gear is my shadow light. I love my shadow light. And um, <laughs> I, I mean, so many people on trail would ask me about it and I would just talk their ear off about it. I love <laughs> that backpack. It is, I think, absolutely perfect. <laughs> um, the only thing that um, I got myself in trouble with, uh, my pockets. Um, pockets are a danger for me because I, I can fill pockets. <laughs> so uh -huh. sometimes I would find myself stuffing like if we'd be in town and, you know, we'd go to a convenience store or something, I'd shove some extra stuff in there. So I'd add extra weight for me for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, I <laughs> stretch pockets got you in trouble. And I was like, yeah, but, <laughs> oh man. And I mean, even going through the whites, I think I told you guys this, I had to sew it up a, a couple of times because those branches are so, so um, thick and just, pokey they ended up ripping a couple places in my my pack in the mesh pack, or just the mesh, in, just yeah, the the mesh. mesh. yeah okay um everything else know. just held up amazingly but i mean even this it was so easy to sew it up it was it was just a quick little sew here and i did it with colorful um thread because you know it looks prettier <laughs> <laughs> makes it unique but, uh, yeah yeah no i mean this is absolutely my favorite piece of gear um uh, and, and I want to, one thing that time. Derek, uh, Derek helped us set up this meeting, but, um, he mentioned that the shadow light we're sending to you right now, I believe that you're actually not going to use that one, that you're going to continue with the one you have. Is that true? I or think no? I'm going to continue with this one. I, I opted to get the larger one. So the, um, this is the 40, 45. Um, but you know, it's so, like, I got, I got to Okay. I got to stop you there for a second because we've been getting, we're out of stock on the sixties. Uh -huh. Um, COVID the pandemic has ran a course, particularly on our backpack stock and uh -huh. people, people blew, we, we sold through one, the backpack has done very, very well for us. And, right. and so it, the stock went through really fast, but then, um, our 60 liters went out of stock and, and there's so many people that think they need the 60 liter. But when we go out on a trip, I look around and 90% of our staff has 45 liters. You've got a 45 liter. You're doing a massive hike. Is that big enough? I mean, what do you, what did you feel about the size of it? I really felt like it was big enough. Um, like when we went through the hundred mile wilderness and I had quite a bit of food because of course now we had food for five days, but also I'm eating a lot more than I had been. So I couldn't quite get it to roll down. <laughs> um, but um, aside from that, it, it was perfect for me that the entire trip. Um, the reason that I wanted to go with the 60 was that my husband and I are considering the PCT. Um, and we were told that there are certain portions that uh, you have to have a bear canister. And I thought, mm having a larger pack would allow for us to put it still um, in there. In and, the pack. 
Yeah. Awesome. And so that was really my only consideration on that. But um, Got it. also the, the 60 didn't seem to fit me as well. Mine just, it fits perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I think, I think really Tracy, what you're going to do is you're going to load up your husband's pack and stay nice and light on the trail with your 45. <laughs> no, you know, no. I, I did tell him there was a couple that I met in the whites. No, sorry. In, in Maine. And, um, the, the wife, she, they were both older and the wife really did not ever want to go on this trip at all, but her husband wanted to go on the trip. And the only way that she was going to go with him was if he carried all the heavy stuff. So this gentleman carried everything. He carried wow. the tent, he carried the cook stove. And not only that, he went and got all the water wow. and he cooked for them. And I looked at my husband when we got home and I said, would you ever do that for me? And he said, not if you plan on eating. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I don't think I could do it, but I mean, it was how it worked for them. So, I mean, not yeah. judging. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Got it. Okay. So that's, that's piece number one. What's, okay. what's the next um, couple pieces here? I love my tents. I have the um, copper spur, but it's the okay. bike pack. I got that on a, garage sale at REI. So it was a really good price as well. But um, I do, I am looking to kind of trade that out only because it's almost four and a half pounds when you have the fly and the footprint with it as well. And I know that they have um, maybe the tiger wall that's a little bit, the ultralight tiger wall that might be like a pound and a half lighter. And uh, my Fly Creek, tent, right? I think the Fly Creek. Oh, maybe it's popular. the Fly Creek. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, my husband's tent. He has a Durston drop, I believe, or Durston. Yep. Something yep. like this, and it's only I think a pound or two. So um, his tent is really light, but I really do enjoy the freestanding tent. So I, you know, that's gonna run me a little bit more weight. But I have to say, um for this particular journey, it was the right tent for me. Um, you know, I, I mean, it just made everything so much easier. I didn't have to worry about anything. I mean, this being my first really, really big experience, uh, I, I, I think it was the right tent choice for me. Um, and then I had so really fast. Why do uh -huh. you prefer the freestanding versus non freestanding type tents? Um, simplest answer. I watched my husband put up his tent and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it just seems like you have so many different working parts that you have to. And with me, I just pull out the tent poles and they go, doop, 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 doop. Yep. <laughs> and then they just all go together and it's Got a it. real simple process. Got it. Um, yeah. I, that, that makes and, sense to me. I will say, um, we, we kind of, we sell both or we will sell both. We don't have our, our non freestanding options available yet. Not until next year, but um, a little bit of time and a little bit of, and I think, I think it won't be as painful, but it is always a little bit more work or tweaking to set those up. So it does, it, it right. makes sense as well. So got it. Okay. So keep going. Third piece yeah. of gear. And then my, I have two for my third piece of gear, but it's my quilt that I got from you guys. I have the Outdoor Vitals uh, 15 degree quilt, but originally I started with the um, the Nemo 20 degree, and I love that thing. It is it's fluffy and it, I can sink into it, but it was uh, it took up 11 liters i think of space in my mm -hmm. pack, and it was three pounds. So wow. I had to. I had to choose um, something lighter and I went with you guys that I got the top quilt and it's perfect. I love it. Do and you have the newer generation one that has like a baffle or no? The older one. Um, Does it have like a baffle right up around your neck that kind of hangs off of the drawstring? Does that make sense? Um, no, it doesn't. It okay. doesn't. I got mine in June. So okay. did it right. come out after that then? I launched like right around that time so okay no I, so I, we're gonna have to plan on what are we gonna spend your a thousand you know thousand dollars i know i gotta you <laughs> might want to give that to your husband and get the newer one um because you'll if you love that one you will really love the next one okay. um it it just kind of uh hugs the body and just seals 
like naturally a little bit more naturally, but, oh, right. um, no, that's, that's good. I've, <clears throat> I slept in a sleeping bag for like the first time in, I don't know, eight or nine months. I feel like just the other day, because I've just been in our top quotes for so long during the, some of the R and D, but then also just, uh, so I'm a, I'm a big quilt guy. So, yeah. Yeah. I really love it. And it's so light and it takes up so little space. It's perfect. So I would say those, those three items and yeah. they're really important items too. So <laughs> yeah, they are the big, the big ones for sure. Yeah. So that's awesome. Um, well let's, let's circle back to your original why and why you went out on the trail mm -hmm. and kind of how you wanted to have this, this personal journey. And, um, I guess I'd, I'd love to hear how you kind of the conclusion to that, like, did it, did it do, did you go on the journey you wanted to? And did you, did, did you, I don't want to say accomplish cause it's not, a, it's not an accomplishment. Right. But it's like, did you find what you were looking for per se? Yes, I did. Um, I feel like when I got done, I mean, it's even before I got done, when we got to sort of like 400 miles and even 300 miles and 200 miles, you know, I mean, you just start becoming really emotional because it's like, oh my gosh, this is so far, you know, I mean, I, I'm really doing this, you know, and uh, so that was amazing in and of itself. But to get to Springer, um, Springer as a conclusion point, I think was a little less, um, you know, it, like going to Katahdin, it was like this huge thing. And it, it almost felt like, wow, I'm never going to reach that again. But getting to Springer, you know, it didn't even feel like I was really climbing a mountain <laughs> as we were going south, you know, like coasting um, down it, you know, yeah. <laughs> you just <laughs> run straight into there. the ocean or not. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and uh, my friend Bouncer had gone and, and summited with me and I just could not help myself. I was bawling. I mean, this was amazing. And, um, you know, and then again at Amakalola, you know, it was amazing to be there under these arches where, you know, people have started this journey, people have finished this journey and um, it's powerful. Um, but I will say that um, as I was going on the journey and as I was, you know, especially as I was finishing up, it kind of, um, also was a thing that I realized that, you know, as much as I needed to do something for myself, um, it's amazing how much I really felt like I would have enjoyed it so much more had my husband been with me because, you know, there was a lot of my journey where I was by myself. And um, when you're by yourself, or even if you meet up with people at the end of the day, you know, you still wish that, oh my gosh, this was so beautiful. Like McAfee, you know, it's like you're sheriff. sitting out there and it's like, I guess I'll get a picture of myself, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but something as beautiful as that, you know, you wish you had people there to share it with you. Um, and so I, I do feel like I accomplished what I, I needed to accomplish, but I also feel like, um, I don't want to do anything like that again by myself. I want to do yeah. it with, you know, other people with my husband, my family. So I, I, I think that's a good way to, to I, I can just relate, I guess, to that. Like, just, you want to be able to just remember that. And, and it's hard, you know, it, it it's easier to remember or, or to, to reminisce and experience mm -hmm. those emotions again, when you can talk with someone who is there with you and experiencing the same right. thing. Right. So that's going to yeah. be a lot of fun because you guys are now planning another hike, right? Yes, we are planning to do well, we have to get the permits first, but on November 9th, we go and apply for permits for the PCT. And that is what we'd like to do together next year. So that will be amazing. That'll be yeah. really cool. Yeah, um, totally different trail. Are you excited for just the differences in the trails? Yeah, I mean, I'm excited to I mean, it's amazing to see photos of people out there on that trail because it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of green tunnel. <laughs> and no. uh, that, is one <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that is one thing that uh, was always amazing that, wow, um, I haven't seen the skyline in ages. <laughs> and and sometimes you that. get out there and 
you know, gut hooks, which is now, I can't remember the new name for it, but, um, you know, it would say there's a view in 0.1 miles <laughs> and you get there and it's like, there's no view. There's no view. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, there's like maybe a little hole in the tree line, but right. it's really not a view. <laughs> so. Yeah. When I was, when I was 18, I moved to Virginia beach for a while and, uh, was doing a job out there. And I just remember, cause growing up in, in Utah, just always mountains, it's a desert, honestly. And, and so like, I just remember it was like at the end of like the first week, I'm like, I haven't seen the sunset in like seven days. What it just disappears behind these trees and then it's gone. And, but you know, just things like that where you're like, well, this is, you know, so I need to go hike back East. I really do. I, and I, and I unfortunately can't say that I have yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, the CDT or the PCT seem way more appealing to me, but that's, you know, that's my heritage. That's where I'm from. And, and I just, right. I love the mountains. I love being at high elevation and in the peaks and, and, and the views and stuff, but, um, I need to go appreciate back East as well. But yeah, so. I mean, it's definitely, there are hardy people that are hiking in the East. I'm telling you, I mean, the, the mountains there, they're no joke, you know, and the terrain, it's no joke, but, um, I mean, it's also really, I feel very blessed that I've had the opportunity to hike over there now. And, you know, being as how we're from, or well, we live on the West Coast, it's um, it's nice that we'll be able to enjoy this as well. <laughs> right, so. right. Well, I really appreciate you coming on, Tracy. Um, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I hope that our, our listeners do as well. Um, really quick, um, do you just want to maybe, do you, I mean, I've, I've said it in there, but obviously you can go find Tracy at Reluctant Hikers or any other areas that you'd want um, our followers to to come and follow you um, um, or to get well, in contact I with have, you if they wanted to. Yeah. I'm, I mean, the Re reluctant hiker on YouTube and I think it's uh, the reluctant hiker 72 on Instagram, but I think there's links on both that they can find me and uh, yeah. And if they're um, interested in finding out more, if they have questions, there's a DM possibility and, and uh I think comments on YouTube and everything. And, and yeah, that's absolutely great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, if you get the permits and you get to go do this hike this next year, it would be pretty fun to, to bring you back on and, and hear how that hike goes. Um, maybe yeah, absolutely. let your husband tag along and see what his, his side of the story was at times, but. Well, um, but just remember my side of the story is the correct one. Correct. <laughs> that's, that's just fine. He can sit in the background, you know, and, and just, just yell over your shoulder every once in a while. Right. <laughs> no, that'll be, that'll be a lot of fun. And, and if you get those permits and get to go do it, um, um, it'd be fun to, to bring you back on and hear how that trail goes as well. So um, appreciate it, Tracy. And also for just all of you listening, um, thanks for listening. If you haven't rated and reviewed the podcast, go do that. Make sure you are subscribed. Um, and yeah, we've got more amazing content to come on the Live Ultra podcast. So uh, we'll catch you on the next episode. <laughs>